Hello, and a warm welcome to the Content Podcast. I hope you're all well, and I won't waste any time in getting into today's episode, in which I'm joined yet again with another brilliant guest. He is, of course, Coventry City winger, Mr. Jody Jones. Jody, a huge thank you for coming on the show, firstly. Um, and I don't think it would be a podcast in 2021 without mentioning COVID and the pandemic. So how have you been during it, and what have you been doing to keep yourself busy during this, this strange time? Um, yeah, just a quick one. Thanks for uh, obviously having me on and I hope you're well as well. But um, yeah, COVID, it's a strange one, bro. Um, nobody's used to it. Um, there's a lot of people suffering a lot more than others. But me and my family, we've, we've been we've been OK, to be fair, like not too bad, really. It's obviously been strange, um, but we're just, just trying to get on with it, you know, really just trying to do what we can do and just get on with it, man. It's life at the end of the day, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So just before we get into it, could you give us a little update on the injury and how it's coming along and how you are? Yeah, so a lot a lot of people want to hear this and and, and hear what I've got to say about it. So uh, I'll get into it. It's like, so obviously it's, it's the third time um, I've done the same injury on my knee. And um, obviously we've all looked into it now and I just thought there has to be a problem here. Like why why is this happening why why is it only happen it happens a lot in football it happens a lot but why has it happened to me three times in such a short period of time so it's it's a frustrating one and uh, it's a hard one for me and my family to take uh, it was horrible having to find out that I've done it again um it was horrible having to ring my parents and letting them know obviously as you know I'm from London so my family ain't really up here but ringing them letting them know just all that stuff is horrible man like it's heartbreaking like there's nothing worse but like I said, I'm just I'm cracking on with it now. I've gone to see the best surgeon possible to to sort out my knees, which I'm very lucky with. So I'm blessed that I got to go and see that guy, and um, he sorted out my left knee, which I came back and I was doing well. Scored a couple of goals in pre-season, and my knee had felt fine. But then just after pre-season, I'd done it again on my right knee, which had which which was basically just a normal knee. And my left knee was obviously done by the surgeon that I mentioned. And he added a little bit of extra strength in there, which he thought that I needed on my knee. So obviously it happened to my right knee, which showed that I needed that strength for my right knee as well, because my knees, there just must have been something wrong with them. It could have been the amount of football that I've played over the years. Because honestly, like I don't know anyone that's played more football than me, like in school, after school, in cages, everywhere, like non-stop football, non-stop. So... It could have been my genetics. It could have been anything like that. But like I said, now I've got I've got two perfect knees. We joke about it and call them like robot knees because they're literally better than normal human knees. So I'm 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 as confident as ever, bro. Honestly, like a lot of people would doubt me, which is fair enough. Like you can doubt me if you want because if if, you, if someone does their knee three times, you're gonna think, wait, hold on a minute, there's something wrong. But like I said, I've got good people around me, good fans, good friends, good family, and I'm as confident as ever, man. I've got two good knees, and I'm gonna I'm gonna smash it when I get back. Definitely, I think that's the perfect attitude to have. And it's often said by many athletes that it is the hardest thing to go through during someone's career, cope with injuries. But how tough, I know you touched on it a little bit there, saying it's horrible to say to your family, look, we're in this situation again. But from your experiences, how tough really is it? You know what? This is why I like doing these little things like this, because it, I, don't, I don't think it gets spoken about enough. So like when I speak about this now, a lot of people that will watch this will be like, wow, okay, like, this is a real insight on how it is. So for starters, I'll tell you, everybody think footballers have got it cushy because they get paid a good wage. And people think, oh, it's okay, like he gets this amount of money, he gets this amount of money, rare, rare, rare. But money's not everything, man. It, it literally ain't everything. When I was younger and I was getting paid a good wage for the first time, I was thinking, this is nice. Like I can get the latest Balenciagas, I can get... The, the newest air the newest air forces and stuff like that and I, I love trainers I love stuff like that but you know what this happening to me has made me mature so much and I still do buy them little things but I don't do it as much I do it to myself say if I sign a new contract if I score a good goal or something I'll treat myself whereas before I just keep I'd be buying these things and now I know that money isn't everything because and I know a lot of people will think oh well he's this guy's injured he's probably on thirty thousand pound a week so that's not a problem but the truth is that is the problem because everybody that's a football player started off as a kid and wanted to be a football player. When you're a kid, you don't know anything about money, but you know how much you love the game and how much you love football. So for me, it's possibly the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. 
except from maybe like a, a family member passing away or something, I'd say it's underneath that. It's probably the second worst thing then that, that could happen to me as a football player because it's blood, sweat and tears in there. It, you don't you don't see it all. You don't you don't see it all unless you're there in the gym every day. Like I remember last the second time I did my knee, um, I was going in every day. I was the first one in, the last one out and I'd, I'd wake up in the morning and you know how much I love going to football in the morning, training. I'm thinking I'm going to go in today. I'm going to rip up training and I'm going to go home. Then I'm going to play PlayStation. And like, and it just, it was, it was too nice. It was too good to be true. And then like, like I said, when I got injured every morning, I was thinking, I don't want to go in. Like, I do not want to go into this place. I'm going to go in the gym. I'm going to get on the bike. I'm going to pedal on the bike. I'm going to look out the window because it's right in front of me. I'm going to see everybody laughing, training. And I'm just sitting here depressed, like, like so so stressed like thinking I've got nine months of this like nine months like this is this is horrible and like like I said a lot of people might think stuff like oh like he he needs to leave now or he, he gets injured too much like people need to realize like no footballer wants to be injured it's unfortunate it's unlucky and I think if people looked at it from a different perspective as if it was their friend or their son or their brother like they wouldn't speak like that it honestly being injured it's horrendous. Like I've never like cried so much in my life when I'm when I've except from when I've been injured. Like it's so boring. It's so like it's just and especially when the team's playing and you just know you can't help them. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. I mean, I can only imagine what it really feels like to go through it. And everyone just sort of thinks, oh well, he's injured, so he's not going to play this weekend. And that's all that a lot of people think about. But you're you're the one who's left with the every single day, the the morning waking up for a match day, knowing how you'd feel if you were to play, compared to getting up, going to another game and another another bit more time on on the sidelines. And so, what have you been doing then to keep yourself busy during the time on the sidelines with the injury? I mean, this may lead us on nicely to something that I really want to talk about: your very own clothes brand. I mean, I think it's brilliant that you have got other interests and. To go through obviously injuries, it, it may make you realise you you may have to have other interests just to keep you going. Um, so as I said, you know I think it's brilliant. So is that what's been keeping you occupied? Yeah, like I said, man, I, I, from young, if if like, not many people have known me from young from Coventry because obviously, like I said, I grew up in London. But if you ask anybody in London, I'm football mad. Everything I done, everything I done was football. If you see me walking down the street going to get bread or milk for my mum, I'll take a football with me. Like, I was football crazy. I still am football crazy. But what I have learned now is there's more to life than football. I still love football. Football is my favourite thing in the world. And I, I don't know what I would do without it because not to be funny or there's nothing wrong with it, but I'd probably just, if I didn't play football, I'd probably be working just somewhere local like Sainsbury's or Tesco or something like that. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a normal job. My parents have normal jobs. But like I said, just without football, I just, I, I just, I don't know what I would actually do. But yeah, like since, since I've been off, I've always been into fashion. As I mentioned about trainers earlier, I've always been into fashion. And I've always, I've always liked to kind of dress a little bit different, not, not too quirky so that it, people think, hold on a minute, what's this guy wearing? But just a bit different to others so that, I'm just not the same as everybody, you know what I mean? But obviously people will end up dressing similar nowadays, so it's pretty hard to do that. But yeah, like I said, I just, I've always wanted to start my own clothing brand. One of my friends mentioned it to me. One of my good mates, Asa, mentioned to me about four years ago. He said, like, you need to use your, like, your 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 status, like, like your Instagram and stuff like that. And you need to be, you need to do stuff with it, be a bit more busy with it. Like, you can do stuff like that with the amount of followers and that you have. And I just thought, uh, no, I'm not, I'm just, all, all I really care about is football. So, like I said, yeah, when I got injured, um, obviously I was speaking with Connor. You obviously know him. He made his own clothing brand, which you're wearing right now. And we were speaking and um, we were just saying, like, we could do it together. And I think if we would have done it together, it would have honestly been perfect. But like I said, I just, when I was younger, not not too young, about maybe, maybe about two, two and a half years ago, I mentioned to my dad that I wanted to make my own clothing brand. And he said, oh, okay, like, I'll help you out if you need any help or anything like that. And obviously you can see it. I've got the hat and the, the hoodie on. Um, it's called Felici London. And obviously I grew up in London. So it means a lot to me. Like growing up in London is quite tough. I know everybody has the little thing like London's rough, this, this, that. But honestly it wasn't. Growing up in London was tough. So it means a lot to me growing up in London and to, to still be here now and doing doing what I love. 
I feel like I've come a, come a very long way and I'm doing really well. So, and obviously Felici, my name's Jody J. Felici Jones. And uh, that's my dad's side of the family's name, Felici. So I thought it was a bit different. It sounded quite cool. Um, and I just thought, you know what? I might as well go for it now while I'm injured. I've got nothing else to do and it will take my mind off it. And this first four months of being injured, it took my mind off of it a lot more than I thought it would have because I'm still focusing on football. So whoever's watching this, don't get it twisted. Like I'm, I'm not forgot about football. Like that's my main, main thing. And like I said, when I am back playing, I'm going to let my, my, my dad and people like that take control of this but like I said it just helped me take my mind off it and when I was sitting at home I wasn't sitting there stressing thinking about football too much I was thinking oh what what design do I want what what color am I going to get in this hat and this hoodie so yeah man it honestly it, it helped me a lot and I'm, I'm 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 very happy that I did do that otherwise I'd have just been pulling my hair out every day man it looks brilliant and I really do wish you the best of luck with it. So we'll go into the football now. Um, how did it all start for you in terms of, as, as you've mentioned a few times already, it was, it was all you ever thought about. Um, so how did it all start for you initially? Um, so like I said, I've, I've been kicking a football since, I'd say since I could walk, but my parents obviously told me when I was younger, before I could even walk, I was always playing with a football, even whether it was in my hands or if I was on the floor trying to use my feet. But yeah, I think maybe I was about six or seven years old. I went over to my local Sunday league team uh, called Simrab FC. The likes of Ashley Cole, John Terry, players like that have played for Simrab. So it's, it's a very big Sunday league team. You don't really get that many big Sunday league teams, but it was a very popular Sunday league team. And uh, I remember I went over there. My godfather took me because my mum and dad had me when they was very young. So it was hard for them to to do stuff like that and take me to places like that. And uh, my god, I'm luck very lucky. Um, that my godfather was around or I probably wouldn't be where I am now. So I thank him every single time. And my godmother as well. They helped me so much, my godparents. But um, they took me over to the, one of the training sessions. And um, I remember I had an Arsenal kit on, I had short hair. I remember I remember the day like it was yesterday. And I got the ball and I was just running past everybody. And nobody could stop me. And they was like, who's this kid? Like, who is he like to my godparents and they were just saying oh like, he's from he's local he lives 10 minutes away but he loves football we thought we'd just bring him over and then I was playing there um and I, th I think it was the first session they said oh well next time he comes we'll put him up a few years because he's just running past these people and since then I just played for my like, Sunday league team. I think I played for them for five years in total because I got a med I got a trophy at the end um about some five-year loyalty trophy kind of thing but as soon as I was playing for them, I was getting interest left, right and centre from literally every team in London. Arsenal, Chelsea, Millwall, West Ham, Crystal Palace, every team. And because I'm so young at the time, I'm not thinking like, this is where I say there's people that love football and there's people that play football because they're just going to get a living out of it and, and, and earn money out of it. Like with me, I just love football so, so much, man. Like honestly, I'll go to the park and play by myself for hours. And like I said, I didn't take any interest. Like, I didn't go like, oh, Arsenal. Like, wow, I support Arsenal. I'd love to play for Arsenal. I, just, I was just enjoying myself. I was playing with my friends. We was beating teams every single week. Like I loved it. And I was playing with my mate. I could be to turn up like just before kickoff, run on the pitch, start playing. And I think that, that's, that's exactly where it started for me. And I remember they kept ringing, ringing, ringing my godparents, like, bring him over to Arsenal, please, please bring him. And I think I waited for about... And, and, and all the other players that got interested as well, they all just left. They all went. And not to be horrible or anything like that, but the majority of them that just went and took the chance, yeah, yeah, I'm going to West Ham, I'm going to Arsenal, they went straight away. A lot of them don't even play football now, which is so interesting, because you'd think going to Arsenal at the age of seven and then getting told you're released at the age of 16, seven to 16, you're going to learn so much. But it just, I just feel like the majority of them, it didn't really happen. And then with me, I stayed at my team for like five years. Then I went to Arsenal. Um, I was at Arsenal for, I think, about a year. And I just, I wasn't enjoying it. Like, it sounds crazy. And uh, Like, a, about 11, 12, you're playing for Arsenal. You think, wow, that, that's mad. But, the truth is I was not enjoying it and I was afraid to tell people that I weren't enjoying it because I didn't want them to think I didn't like football anymore. But it was just too demanding. At that age, it was too demanding. Like 
what my gaffer demands off of me now, and I'm a big man now, is what they were doing at Arsenal at like the age of 11, 12. And, I, and if you think of it now, you can think, you know what, it could be a good thing because it's getting them on it already. But at the same time, you've got to let these kids have fun because me, it, it ruined my confidence. I, I remember one time my dad was taking me to training. He said, you don't look like you want to go today. Do you want to go or not? And I said, I can't lie, I don't want to go. And he said, that's fair enough, boy. He said, if you don't want to go, we'll go home. We went home and he's talking to me and I just said, I just don't like it. I feel like they're demanding so much of me. I was playing so well, I was scoring goals, everything. And then I just, I, I just didn't like it at all. And then I ended up leaving there. I went to West Ham and I felt like it was the same at West Ham. I was there for about six months. And at that age, you don't really have a contract that much. So you can just kind of, if you want, if you want to go, you basically can. So that happened at West Ham. I, I didn't enjoy it. I went to Chelsea as well. And I just felt like it was all the same. And I took a bit of time out from football, um, maybe a year and a half, no, maybe about two years. And obviously I got into like secondary school. My secondary school football team was unbelievable. We were so good. And scouts were at our games because our team was so good. And then West Ham and that, they wanted me back again. I just, I just didn't feel ready. And then I left it for a bit. Then a few of my mates went to Dagenham and Redbridge in League Two. And it was, there was like the under 16s, under 17s time. And they said, just come along, man. You might as well. Like, you're, you're too good to not be playing football. Like, I was, I was playing for my local borough and my school team. And I was like, cool, fair enough. I'll come along. I went along. As soon as I played, they wanted me straight away. They said, yeah, we want to sign you straight away. Like, kind of thing. They signed me. It was a bit weird. But then my friends ended up getting released from there. And I was the only one left. I ended up playing for Dagenham very early at the age of, like, 17. I was, like, the youngest player to play for them. I got a lot of interest straight away. And then the best thing that happened in my career was me getting that move to Coventry because if I didn't move to Coventry, like I said, I probably would have got in a lot of trouble or been in the wrong place at the wrong time kind of thing if I was still in London. So I'm grateful. I thank God for the move that he got me to Coventry. And like I said, everything happens for a reason and I'm still here now at Coventry. So hopefully I have a good career, good, good, good uh, rest of career with Coventry. So, like you said, about four or five years ago, the journey at Coventry City began for you. But initially, it was a loan deal. Um, what first attracted you to the Sky Blues then? Um, yeah, so like I said, I, I literally had quite a lot of interest and I didn't really want to leave Dagenham because, like I said, I enjoy football so much and I was just having so much fun. And I remember my, a few of the staff at Dagenham literally said to me, like, you have to leave. Like, you've got to go. And I was like, why? They said the, the, the facilities... All the stuff like that will be so much better. And you deserve that. And I was like, okay, fair enough. And I had a few teams. I think it was like Brighton, MK Dons. Uh, I can't remember all of them. And obviously Coventry. And I, I don't know what caught my eye with Coventry, but I remember looking at the table. They looked like they was in a decent position. Obviously, a lot of people would have just said Brighton because Brighton were like, I think they, I thought if they were the champ or the prem then. And I, I came up to Coventry, I met, the manager and stuff and I just and the, the the things he said to me and what he wanted me to do it just clicked straight away I said yeah I want to be with this guy because I know I'm going to succeed at this club and I, I, um, I, I knew a bit about Coventry anyway I'd heard about them I knew Joe Cole was there and that played a massive part on it as well because my first ever football kit was a West Ham kit with Joe Cole on the back so I thought wow like there's the likes of Joe Cole there's it seems pretty pretty good, you know. So obviously I came down and then the rest just, just went from there. The club that you're at now, Coventry, as we said, they're currently in the championship for the first time since 2012, I believe, um, which is a great achievement in itself. And I think it would be fair to say that the main goal is to stay in the division this year. But just how far can this Coventry City side go? Honestly, I believe like I said, I believe in myself massively and I believe in the team massively as well. We're like a family. We're not a normal club. We're honestly like a family. The gaffers come in and the assistant. And I'm, I think I'm the longest serving Coventry player at the moment. So I remember when this gaffer came in and the assistant and they've took us from League Two to League One to the Championship. Like that is an amazing achievement. Uh, I don't think it goes unnoticed because people know that's an amazing achievement. But the, the players we have and the bond all the players have and the gaffer and the assistant we have is top, top level. And like I said at the moment, the players we have, the football we play, the 
the way the gaffer's got us playing football is is at a very, very good standard. So um, people say their aim is to stay in the championship and obviously that would be very good to stay in the championship. But I believe we can definitely stay in the championship and we can push for a little playoff place because it's, it's, still, it's still tight and it's still tight and anything can happen in football. You could go on a five-game win streak and literally that's like 15 points. That's such a big difference. So like I said, anything can happen in football and I honestly think we can do really well. I mean, it's clear to see from social media and talking to a lot of my friends that are Coventry City fans that they love you. Um, how good does it feel knowing that you have the full support of the Sky Blue Army? It's massive, you know, honestly, because if your own fans don't believe in you, it can honestly knock your confidence. It can make you feel quite bad. And I try to thank the Coventry fans in everything I do, Instagram posts, um, interviews for the Cobb Telegraph, anything like that, and even stuff like this. So I thank them massively. They've stuck by me. It's so easy to forget about a player when they've not played for how long I haven't played. But they have faith in me. They know what I can do on the pitch. They believe in me. They know how hard it's been for me. And I just want to repay the club and the fans. And that's exactly what I'm going to do when I come back. When I come back, I know what I can do. The fans know what I can do. And like I said, I'm going to repay them, every single one of them, whether it's on the pitch or off the pitch. I try to do as much off the pitch as possible. I try to do my bit for the community. So they respect it and I respect them all so much. They're, they're honestly the greatest fans. So you still have, I mean, plenty of years, hopefully, in football. Um, and the content wishes you many, many more goals. But what would you say so far is your favourite goal? Um, I do a bit of streaming. Um at home sometimes and just interact with the fans and they always ask me this question so I always say the goal against Lincoln away um, just because it was such an it was such a it was such a weird finish like I don't think a lot of people expected it to go in from that angle and that game I had about three players marking me the whole game and I was getting frustrated I couldn't really do anything every time I got the ball I had to turn back or I couldn't run through them because there was too many so I remember getting the ball and I just thought, if you're going to keep backing off for me, I'm going to squeeze it in the corner soon. So the guy kept, they kept backing off and I managed to squeeze one in the corner and I've done a little celebration after because the fans were literally killing me that game. They were just shouting so much abuse at me for no reason at all. So that was probably my best goal. So just um, as, as you've uh, touched on there a little bit about the fans being on you and stuff, I mean, it's got the capability of just absolutely eating you alive, um, an atmosphere like that, but... For someone who comes across very confident like yourself, would you say that's a, a big incentive in terms of motivation for you to go, you know what, keep bringing the stick and I'll, sh I'll show you what I can do? Yeah, I, I love it. I honestly, honestly love it. I'll give a bit back as well. It's just, it's, it's just banter at the end of the day. And some people are horrible and they actually mean it, but like I thrive off it. I actually love it. It sounds weird, but I love it so much because I love proving people wrong. I love playing under pressure. Because I just I just love being that guy that just proves people wrong. So when I'm getting stick left, right and centre, for example, a Cov fan, I think, put something on Twitter about me. And like I said, 99% of the Coventry fans are amazing. They're brilliant. But then you just always get, I wouldn't even call it that. You just always get a, a certain someone who just makes a Twitter account and just says something. And I, I, I don't believe it's fair to really, I don't think they should be allowed to do that. I think social media platforms like Instagram, Twitter and stuff like that, you should have to show like your ID and stuff and you should only be allowed one account, etc. Because it can honestly make people depressed seeing stuff like that. With, with me, luckily enough, that stuff don't make me depressed. But my injuries did make me depressed. And so I know what depression feels like. I didn't really share it with a lot of people except from my family. So it's kind of the first time I've mentioned it, but I was in a dark, dark place. I was so depressed. And I hated every minute of it. So stuff like that, receiving stuff on Twitter and stuff, it's not nice because it will really hurt some people. And as I was saying, like a cough fan wrote something like Jody Jones will be playing in like a Sunday league team in a few years or something like that. I wrote back to him actually. I said, you're my biggest inspiration. And then about two days later, I scored the winner in the 90th minute against Burton. And then about four days after that, five days after, I scored another goal against Peterborough. And people was honestly slating him. So like it honestly, it back, it ends up backfiring. Like and like I said, as soon as that guy had wrote that to me on Twitter, he didn't get in my head, but he made me. He did make me think. You know what? I can't wait to prove you wrong. Like I love it. Like please keep it coming because I screenshot it. When people do stuff like that, I screenshot it and I look at it and I think I can't wait to prove you wrong. So I thrive off it. I actually love it. Yeah. 
I'm glad actually that you've touched upon it a little bit and it's great to actually hear that things like that don't affect you but if you could give a little bit of advice for someone who is maybe struggling or receiving that abuse what in terms of coping mechanisms do you use just to sort of brush it off and not let it affect you in a in a really bad way without being horrible what what I think and how I've noticed it and what a lot of people have told me when maybe I couldn't deal with it at first was just was just that the people doing this are hating on you or they're jealous because they're not in the same position as you and they want to be so the only thing I'd say is just take it as an ins just take it as inspiration and just make it motivational because it's, it's, it's good to sometimes have people that don't really believe in you because it's just a, it's such a good feeling proving them wrong and like I said if you don't like it just try it just just ignore it because think about it like I said with the Coventry fans I'll get a thousand unbelievable messages and then I'll get two that ain't and you can't compare one thousand with two you know what I'm saying you can't compare one thousand with two you can't let two bad things put you down when you've had a thousand good things that's the best way to look at it and there's always going to be more positive than negative so I look at all the positive ones and just ignore all the negative ones. I block the people that are negative. I block them, block them out, so I just don't have to see it no more. Because it's not, it ain't nice to see, it, especially when you've got family and friends and a girlfriend that have accounts and they see that stuff as well. So that's why I say it's not fair because these people are allowed to voice their opinions. I think my girlfriend's sister said it in our group chat, something like, it, "Yeah, if if your if your opinion is negative, just keep it to yourself." And I thought, you know what? That's so true. If your opinion is not positive or it's not going to help the person in any way, shape, or form, keep it to yourself. Why do you need to share it with people? Because if I was to voice back my opinion to you, you would not like it, and I'd probably get fined. So it's not really fair. You know what I'm saying? Such a long-winded thing because it just seems like it's never going to end. I mean, it's a it's a big big exactly. issue that I think I think definitely could uh, do with a lot more discussion on. I mean, moving on to more of a, a positive vibe. You mentioned that the Lincoln goal was y your favourite goal. Would you say that goal was your best memory in football or would it be something else maybe? Growing up as a dream is to be a professional football player and signing a professional contract and being able to tell people I'm a professional football player and I'm not literally, I think my dad told me a stat the other day, it's literally like 1% of, of, a, of a certain, I forgot how many it was, 1% make it as a professional football player. And to put myself in that bracket and say that I'm part of that 1% is a massive achievement. Not saying I'm hard done by or anything like that, but especially where I came from. To get to where I am now, that is why I'm so positive and I'm so confident I can overcome this injury because I've come so far, so, so far. And a lot of people won't know what I've been through or my family's been through. But like I said, growing up in London just isn't normal unless you're from London and you know about it. Like A lot of people from London will know about it. So like I said, I feel like I've come so far. So to become a professional football player, that has to be my best memory. And obviously... Growing up and seeing Wembley as well, playing at Wembley was, was a sick memory, but becoming a professional football player and actually signing that contract and going home, I remember getting in the car and just screaming, like, I'm a professional football player, like, I cannot believe it. That, that has to be my best memory. Yeah, sounds um, just one of them experiences that you, as you say, you just always dream about, always think about, and then to finally put pen to paper, it would have been... As you, as you explained then, just such an incredible feeling. So looking ahead, um, of course, I mean, the short-term goal is to get fit and firing again on that football pitch. But what would you say are the long-term goals for Jody Jones? Long-term goals? Um, that's a tough one because lately I've just been really thinking about short-term goals. Obviously, you know the short-term goals are to get fit. The long-term goals for me is just to still be playing football in the, in, in, in the, in the long-term because... It's like I said, football is my passion. I love football so much, and hopefully, being in the Premier League with Coventry, that would just that would be a dream come true. Like I said, I'm not from Coventry; I'm from London. But Coventry does feel like home to me now. Coventry feels like home to me now. I'm loved in Coventry. The fans, like you said, the fans. I remember my girlfriend's mum said to me not long ago, she's never seen like a bunch of fans love somebody so much. And without sounding like I'm. Like just blowing my own trumpet or bigging myself up like they do love me and I appreciate it so much I love them all back so it'll be so good to be in the Premier League with Coventry one day honestly that would probably be the best feeling ever so before we finish um, I wanted to just ask you a few quick fire questions about your teammates just so the Coventry fans can get to know the squad a little bit better from from your point of view so we'll start off with who's the quickest in the side Ooh, quickest 
it was Ryan Giles, but he's not here now. He just literally he he went on loan back. He went back to Wolves and went on loan the other day. So the quickest now, uh, it might be Bakayoko. You know, I'm not too sure. It might be Bakayoko. So we'll go from that end of the spectrum to the other one. Who's the slowest at the club? Slowest. Hmm. That's a hard one, you know. There's not we, we don't really have any slow players. Come on, I've if, got to push you if, for if, at least one. Uh, if I had to pick one, it will end up it will probably end up being one of the defenders. Uh, I actually, I'm I'm honestly so stuck on that one. Maybe actually, you know what? I'll say a goalkeeper. Probably a goalkeeper. I'll say Ben Wilson. <laughs> All right, I think you've had a bit of a cop out there, but I, I, I'll, I'll let, I, I'll let I, you I have it. I, our team's quite fast, honestly. There's no one that's really that slow. So yeah, all right. I'll I'll give you it. I'll give you it. So who would you say the uh, best finisher at the club is? Best finisher, probably Matty Godden. He yeah. just has a, he has he has such an eye for goal. The other strikers are brilliant finishers as well, but you can see what Matty Godden was doing, especially last season as well. He's just such a such a good goal scorer. Yeah, definitely. And um, before I ask this one, I might have a bit of an idea considering you've got your own clothes brand, but. Who's the best dressed at the football club? I'm always having myself for that all the, <laughs> all, all the time. Well, obviously everybody has different uh, dress sense dress senses, but I'd say there's a few people that are kind of they kind of dress the same as me. Like we we're, we're kind of on the same wavelength. I'd probably say like me, Callum O'Hare, uh, Frankie Dabo, us lot are kind of like we dress pretty similar. So you know what's going to come next. Uh, who's the worst dressed at the club? Who's the one player that you see sometimes and think you wouldn't catch me in that? You know what, Ma- Max Biamu, he he wears some nice stuff, and then sometimes he wears some stuff that I don't agree with. But then if I was to wear something that he didn't agree with, he will always he won't care. Like he will let you know. He'll say that is horrible. So <laughs> I'm gonna chuck I'm gonna chuck him in there just because he's the first to always comment. But then. As well, our, our skipper, Liam Kelly, obviously he's a bit older than me, so he dresses different to me. He's more stylish, like more like older, more grown. So maybe someone like that. And <laughs> it's, it's horrible picking them, but probably, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to put you in these situations, but I'm sure the fans will want to know. Uh, who would you say yeah. the joker is in the dressing room? Who's always got the bands? Ben Wilson, Kyle McFasden, um, Frankie Dabo. Probably out of them three, they're always like joking around and quite loud. So another one, who is the most hard working? Who just is relentless in terms of work rate, training, extra hours, all that kind of stuff? Who is the most hard working? The skipper, Liam Kelly, um, he is an absolute engine. Like he does not this guy does not stop running and he sometimes puts the younger boys like myself to shame because he's so fit. It's, it's ridiculous and like I said in training he just gives it 100% all the time and you've got to respect him for that because at the age he is it, it, it's honestly amazing yeah and then the last one who would you say is most likely to become a manager after their playing career would it be the skipper yeah Liam Kelly definitely Um, he, he knows he knows a lot about football obviously he's, he's been in the game for a very long time so It'd probably end up being someone like him. I wouldn't mind being a football manager myself, but I think I'd rather probably be like the assistant and do the coaching side of things. Yeah, just in case it gets a bit too messy. But no, well, Jody, thanks yeah. a lot. I mean, it's been it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show, getting to know you a bit more, and I sincerely hope that you're on that pitch, back doing what you love again in in no time at all. And if people didn't know before why you're such a fan's favourite at Coventry, I think they'll have a bit more of an idea after watching this. Good luck with the brand, the career and anything else that the future has in store for you. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to say thanks to you as well and um, us as footballers as well. Um, I'm pretty sure I can speak on behalf of a lot of football players. We like to speak out about these things and because they don't really get spoken about enough. So for you to do something like this, um, it's honestly amazing, bro. So keep it up. Um, I respect it massively and hopefully speak to you again soon, man. Definitely. No, believe me, the pleasure was all mine. So unfortunately, that's it for today. Thanks again to Jody and everyone else who's tuned into this podcast. 
Be sure to like, subscribe, as well as following the podcast on all social media for more content by the content. Stay safe, everyone, and thanks again.